So I think we'll go straight into the presentation and I'll pass over to uh, Manisha. Thanks, Peter. I'm Manisha Sanasi. I'm a senior consultant at Evolution. I've been working with the company for quite some time. And in that time, I've worked with clients across various sectors, including banking, insurance, government and transport. And I'll let Nick introduce himself. That's great. Thank you, Manisha. So, yeah, I'm Nick Stevenson Steels, also a consultant here at Evolution. Um, and primarily what I do is work with lots of our clients to help them get their live data out to the rest of the business. So all the different data domains can actually understand what is happening from the enterprise architecture perspective. Um, I've previously worked um, within uh, the UK, uh, well, part of the UK government. So I've been on the side of the fence where you're currently sat looking in. Um, so hopefully you'll find what we've got to go through uh, pretty interesting today. We actually really get how you and your colleagues are feeling day after day on a deluge of digital data to deal with, not to mention just the sheer volume of requests for this digital data from those in your organization that either just aren't quite sure where it is or even what they're looking for. Let's face it, that is now often the norm of the modern day workplace, especially now when your workplace is often at home. The challenge we're all facing is figuring out how on earth we can make sure that the business is engaging with all of the relevant insights that you guys, all as enterprise architects, produce. After all, as EAs, more often than not, you have a bird's eye perspective of the complexity of your business. We know that successful businesses, they need to be data driven. They need to be able to strategically manage old technology and new by showing a clear line of sight to the business outcomes that the team is focused on. Often this is cost, but it also includes areas such as security risks and or customer satisfaction. Overcoming resistance is all about communication. It's about collaboration, but also about curating all of this information and automating data management so that it's current, live, and as self-service as possible. Now, let's be honest, IT management is trending much towards uh, the complexity side of things. So we're looking at the connections, we're looking at the links, integrations, stacks, apps, clouds, distributed systems, data scroll, and those stubborn to eradicate silos that are just continuing to proliferate. At its core, the future of IT is about collaborating successfully to manage this complexity. But here's a tip. The type of complexity that we as architects deal with can be pretty confronting and daunting for lots of the business collaborators that we work with. So instead, we find we get the best results by presenting the EA views and information which are showing how we solve this complexity. So the trick is to expand your field of fullness and influence by bringing order rather than chaos. We're providing a solution to a problem. It's very powerful to provide people access to the details that they need that's relevant to their specific role, to give them back time, particularly on manual tasks, such as filling in lists, performing any calculations, or drawing diagrams. And most importantly, to give them a sense of control that they can rely on the data and therefore get the insight that, again, they need and when they want it. And today, that's what we're going to be talking about, the techniques that can help your team do this, including data management integrations and how to engage with your collaborators so they will become allies and champions in the organization. So to start with, let's have a look at the idea of giving details. We can get past resistance by giving people the details that they need. I'm putting a lot of influence on, uh, influence on they need. Integrations are a great way of doing this. And we're going to talk much more about this later on. But initially, your superpower as enterprise architecture team is in connecting the dots and bringing together the details that your colleagues need and want into a single central view. Most of this, by the way, is already existing in your organization. And then we can continue to gain buy-in by keeping this data valuable. 
your colleagues in the trenches are likely to be comfortable using the tools that they're just used to already. They're their own planners, their own spreadsheets. We all get comfortable doing what we know. So one way we can get past the resistance to uh, this idea of having a new environment is to embed the EA data into existing familiar environments. And examples of these include the tabs on Microsoft Teams or something like your company internet. There's many more examples that we could go into. But using single sign-on, what you're able to do is let the user can actually be automatically provision, provisioned and they can be working straight away without any hurdles in requiring login details. So they're using the credentials that they have uh, to log into their machine on a daily basis to get that ease of access. We often think technical projects need technical answers, but EA data is a strategic topic also. To succeed, your project needs to be widely known. So take control of your own project story and check in regularly um, to tell the story of your project's aims and its progress. Become the go-to team in a crisis crisis and the day-to-day -day environment. As we all know, application data, it's, it's a moving target. The data is what's driving the decisions that are being made. And so it's important that it's being kept current. How often have we all tried to work with uh, our data and we've wanted to query the data in some way? And we're realizing that it's not, it's not in date, it's not been updated for months, years, however long it's been sat there, it's just not been touched, or we're updating different sheets and it's just out of sync. The application lists and visual application lists, visualizations and reports should be easy to find. Ideally, we'll keep them on, online and embedded in part of the everyday workplace applications that we use. Again, I'm referring to Microsoft Teams or on your intranet. The idea is that your colleagues have a, a low barrier to entry in terms of working within an enterprise architecture tool. Or at least in most cases, they're not even realizing they're using an EA tool at all. They're simply managing their data within existing applications. Application managers, process owners, and other stakeholders can make updates to this data easily. They can start conversations with other users and make sure that that data isn't going stale. Built-in validations and predefined lists will also help your users to update the data without entering any invalid information. The good news is, once you've set up the application catalog, it can also form the basis for keeping tabs on the likes of your cybersecurity metrics and any technical debt metrics, and you can also explore infrastructure dependencies. Talking a little bit about control now, and let's face it, working in EA, I know from a personal point of view, along with working with many of you on, on this call, that we have a tendency to want to harbor that control, maybe a little bit more than we should, but that's okay, because the good, what we need to do with this control freak inside us is have a word with it, because all of the data that we are using, it all can be monitored, it all can be tracked, we can have approval workflows that can be put in place um, that keep data fidelity, high with permissions. So what we're doing is allowing our data owners to be onboarded to have portfolios that they can edit themselves, that we have given them rights to. And they can do this in a browser style view so they can find where they need in a simple to use environment, submit this work so it's then able to be approved by you guys in the enterprise architecture team. All of these changes can be tracked by the log. So all of it is there so we've got that accountability. And this is providing a degree of confidence in the data management for the various regulators that no doubt you all work with. And some of our clients are managing hundreds and thousands of these attributes with this kind of approach. Okay, so whilst we talk about the collaborative data repository as one part of the public, having the in-person check-ins go hand in hand with this. We're not trying to eliminate the human interaction side of things. Because what this is, is a great way to find and build relationships with the internal champions across your business. They're the people that you'll expand your field of usefulness to throughout your organization. 
And often the case will be you have a bit of a mini agenda when you go to talk to uh, these um, collaborators that you, you might not necessarily know. So start with a simple thank you so they know that their data that they've provided is being used. Explain to them how their data has progressed, helped progress a project or what report has it enabled has it enabled you to produce? And just confirm any recent data updates that have been coming in from other collaborators. Let them know that they understand what has been done and so they can understand that it's being done consistently. We don't want this to be a one-hit wonder. But most importantly here, when you're chatting with any collaborators, confirm the story. Tell them the goals that's coming up based on what the data is providing. What's happening next week? What's happening next month, next quarter, next year? Tell them what's coming up. And going on to this, we're looking at the, option, the idea of giving time. And what we're doing now is getting past resistance using another approach by giving people back time. Successful collaboration and co-ownership of data also go hand in hand. Avoid duplication and double handling by using the collaborative tools and integrations that we're go going through today. You're creating a single source of truth. Once, popula once populated, you will have your definitive list of all your applications, all of your servers, all of your capabilities, processes, projects, whatever that may be. The data needs to be updated in real time and co-authoring can prevent this conflict. I alluded to it a little bit before where we talked about working in separate spreadsheets and having these conflicts. Working real time helps prevent this because if we're to schedule a time each month to update each of our list, often we're going to have to book out our time for not just ourselves but for our colleagues as well and find the updated data that we need to update in the repository. So we're just wasting our time and that of others. But now what we can do with the live data updates is you can get your portfolio managers to update any data as soon as it happens. An example of this would be that your company just upgrades a certain application um, to a new version. And now your application manager can quite simply just go and update this information immediately. They don't have to go and jump around spreadsheet, spreadsheet, person to person. They can do it themselves. Properly integrating your data and diagrams is going to save you hours of manual updates. These integrations can run automatically in the background. For example, we can refresh all of our server information by pulling the data from ServiceNow each night or on a schedule that you specify. All of our dashboards uh, that we have and any catalogs are automatically going to update with this new information. Static data, which doesn't really integrate, can sometimes have a bit of a downside because it's just requiring time-consuming manual updates. So this point is actually quite important. Um, anyone who's been on a call with me previously, you'll know that I say this a lot, but excess data can complicate what you do and slow down what you're trying to do. Start simple and work out. Be incremental in your approach to getting data into Abacus. Because in Abacus, you can always add columns to a catalog at a later date and flesh out your repository. So you might start with a simple amount of components, then build that out, flesh that out gradually. Same with the properties, as I mentioned. Get the initial ones that you're going to use to begin with, flesh that out as you go. Bring in the data that is ideal for you in the present moment or in the immediate future. Don't let Abacus turn into a data graveyard. So continuing on with automation and integration, it's important to not let any diagrams and updating diagrams become a rod for your back and slow any of your reporting and communications down which we know it, it quite simply can do because having to update your diagrams on a day-to-day -day basis based on your information, it's quite tiresome. But what we can do is automate these. So the diagram on the left-hand side is just using your data, it's using a pre-structured format to show you everything that is connected to a specific component. In this case, we're looking at a capability. 
we're stepping away from the diagrams, something a little bit more fluid, are the dynamic um, visualizations that we can see on the right hand side. We've got the Gantt charts, which are going to be populated with um, your life cycle dates. That any time they're updated, that's going to update also. And we also have the pre map in the bottom right corner that is again using your properties that once they change, it will change these automatically and update them. So it's saving you time based on your data. You can focus on your data. Um, it's worth pointing out that I know a lot of architects do prefer to use um, just standard diagrams rather than the automated ones. So it's worth mentioning that any time that you do use any diagrams within Alicus to uh, manage and design any future state scenarios or processes, that the data is still going to be updating your diagrams based on any visualizations, which does bring me on to my next point in terms of using your existing diagrams, specifically in this case, your Visio diagrams. We're never going to say, right, you're using Abacus now, scrap all the, all the existing diagrams that you've spent countless hours designing, not at all. What you can do is take an example like we see here and bring that into Abacus. It's the same diagram that we have. And all we've done is brought this diagram in, but we've brought it in as data. So if any of the properties underlying this change, whether it's from the integrations of the service now or from uh, your portfolio management team updating the data, your visualization is going to change color, the connections will change with it. And now I'm going to pass on to Manish to talk a little bit more about the integrations. Thanks, Nick. So we've talked about how we can have live data updates and automations with diagrams. But in addition to this, we can have integrations with third party tools. And we might want to connect to third party tools because they will store the master version of certain data. This could be data on vendor lifecycle information, CMDB asset information, risk profile metrics and product pricing information. And the benefit in integrating is that we're able to cut down on the manual effort required to keep this information up to date. Abacus has various built-in integrations, including those with Technopedia and ServiceNow. Technopedia is the one that we can see here. So it's the world's largest repository of market intelligence on enterprise software and hardware. So they provide a library of common technologies and their product lifecycle, hardware specifications, and product pricing information. And our synchronization lets you look up these products so you can search the Technopedia database and you can import these, including various properties such as the general availability dates, standard support end dates and obsolescence dates. And these properties can help to drive your roadmaps and then they can be updated and refreshed automatically. The information from Technopedia may also tie into content that you have within your CMDB. So CMDBs or configuration management databases will typically store information about your technology services. And Abacus integrates with ServiceNow CMDB, which will store these configuration items such as servers, network elements, and workstations. And you can import these and keep them up to date automatically. And it's really easy to set up an integration. So step one is just to enter in your URL and your credentials. And if we click through to step two, here you create your mappings. So ServiceNow has lots and lots of tables. So you'll pick a table to map to your Abacus component type. And then the next step is to map the fields from ServiceNow to the properties. So you can see that in this mapping window, you've got the on the right, you've got the, the fields, the columns in ServiceNow, and on the left, you've got the properties that you want to map those to. And the value from bringing in this data comes from being able to link it to other data that might not be stored within your CMDB. So you could link your CMDB information to your applications, your processes, your departments, and you can do impact analysis. So you can see right from the business architecture through to the applications, the information and technology architectures how everything is linked. It's also possible to create integrations using our REST API. So Abacus has a two-way REST API, which allows you to read from the Abacus database and write to the Abacus database. 
It uses OData version 4 query syntax, which lets you retrieve the exact information you're after instead of having to sort through lots and lots of results. Some common REST integrations include those with CMDBs, VMware, and BI tools. And it's quite easy to create these. So the first step is to find the endpoints required for your data. And you can use tools such as Postman or Swagger to run your queries and test them. And we have some examples here using Postman. So you can see Postman on the right. And on the left, we've got a few examples. So in the first example, we get the components in the production architecture of the type application. So we send a get request to the components endpoint, and we filter on component type name and architecture name. And in the second example, we get a list of all the diagrams created this month. So we send another get request to the diagrams endpoint this time, and we filter on the created date where that's greater than 1st of July 2020. And then in the third example, we update the element, an existing element, and we update its description. So this time we send a patch request uh, to the components endpoint, but we're specifying the unique identifier of the component that we want to update, and we specify the new updated description. And we provide that in a JSON format, which is commonly used for these data exchanges. I mentioned earlier we can use OData to limit what results we're sending to Abacus. And that's an important point if we move on to the next slide, because too much information leads to complexity. So we really want to limit what we're bringing back from the CMDB and from REST API integrations. Um, and for example, with your CMDB in mind, do we want to bring back all the workstations in use within our organization? Well, perhaps not. Perhaps all we really need to, to know is what makes and models are in use and maybe how many of each of those we have. And even then, it's only worth bringing in this information if we're going to use it in some way, perhaps for road mapping or impact analysis. And once we've imported this data via the integrations and collaborations, the next step is how do we bring this data to life? So whilst it's great to have a single source of truth, and we often hear from our clients that one of their objectives is to create this single source of truth repository where they brought in data from different sources. Um, and you can certainly do that with Abacus, but actually you get that for free with Abacus. And there's so much more that you can do. Um, you, can, you can perform calculations, do impact analysis, and assess your data. And all of that is possible with the algorithms and analytics. So Abacus has a built-in algorithm composer, which allows you to create your own algorithms and perform your own calculations, and you can write back the results to your properties. So for some examples might be to have a sum of your costs or a score of your risks, or even do an entire APM assessment. And all of that is possible with the algorithm composer. And once designed, your algorithms can run automatically. So each time the data refreshes, the algorithm can be triggered to run once again. And these algorithms can help to drive your stakeholder dashboards, such as the, the finance dashboard, which we have here. We'll come on to this in a bit more detail later. Um, but we, we can see costs per area, and we can drill in to see exactly where those costs come from. Alongside the algorithms, we need to think about who are our different stakeholders or lines of business and what information do they need to make their decisions? So the approach should be to identify the KPIs for your stakeholders. Then you can design tailored dashboards to provide the insights around those KPIs. Actually, a common mistake is to try and create like a one size fits all dashboard where you try to provide all the information to all your stakeholders in one go. And the result will be a cluttered dashboard where it's hard to gain value. So instead, think of the KPIs that you have. And we've got some example KPIs here along the top. They're split into strategic, operational, analytical, and tactical. And underneath, they're split into application, security, operations, and technology planning. And then we've got a couple of examples on the right. Um, so where we might want to, to have a dashboard or a report look to show which locations are costing us the most. So here we can calculate this by aggregating the underlying costs of our locations, such as the cost of departments, cost of applications and servers, and we can attribute them to the location. 
And then we can communicate this back to the stakeholder using these interactive tree maps, where perhaps the location is sized by cost, and then you can drill down. And there's also another example there for when can our applications be decommissioned, and we'd look at the life cycle dates, and you can visualize this using a Gantt chart. And now we'll discuss a simple framework to assist in identifying the appropriate KPIs and views to meet our stakeholders' objectives. So a simple exercise to ensure you're providing the right information to your stakeholders is to create a table like this. So initially you want to identify your stakeholder and what is their goal or objective. So in this example, we're targeting C-suite executives who want to reduce IT costs. And the key to success in this process is drilling into the various questions that the stakeholder wants answered. And by creating granular questions, we can identify what are the most appropriate KPIs. So here TCO, as always, is a common metric. And then step five is to identify the analysis techniques required to provide the chosen metrics. So here we'd need to create some algorithms and simulations to give us the output of those KPIs. And finally, on the right, we want to consider the available views that we have at our disposal and choose the best method to communicate those KPIs to our stakeholders. So will they get the most value by showing this information in a chart or a catalog? We often hear diagrams are the best way to, to communicate or even drill down views. So there's lots of different options there. And in this way, we can create focused dashboards that serve a clear purpose. And that brings us on to how to create dashboards to tell a story. And I'll hand back over to Nick. Thank you, Manisha. So when we're looking at telling a story, what we're actually looking at here is giving control, that third prong to uh, the slide that we saw at the start of this presentation. We're giving control to our stakeholders rather than harboring that to ourselves. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in, in terms of starting with storytelling. And what that essentially means is what we're looking to do is to provide stakeholders with access to live, useful information easily. And this is really important for the success of the enterprise architecture team. As we've already discussed, the in-person check-in and meetings, meeting updates are still one of the most important, important elements of this storytelling. So just as important is the architect's role in curating and filtering the information so stakeholders can understand the cost, risks, impacts, and the trade -offs. And Manish has already mentioned before about dashboards, and that's how we do this. We do this with dashboards. So, we start to then think about designing the dashboards. And we've got a little bit of a checklist here, because what we do is initially we start off by thinking, who is our stakeholder? Look at those, the, if you remember the fact in the slide, the four blue boxes are they in the strategic area, operational, analytical, or technical? Where are they? And start to consider the information that they need to get from a dashboard and what what and who do they need to report to. So what we're doing is not only think about who uh, or where our stakeholder is, you need to know who that person is. Consider your user, who they are and what they do. So we're thinking about the KPIs that they require. And often you'll be able to use your own corporate logos and colors in order to do this, but what we need to start to do is think about how they like to receive their information. It's not, it's not about us anymore. It's not about us on the collecting data side. We're getting it out to our stakeholders. What do they want? We need to keep it simple. Let's not overwhelm them with, again, that data deluge that I mentioned first off. Let's not overwhelm them with that. Let's keep it simple. Think about how different charts communicate to that particular audience. Um, and where we can, use the interactive element, elements that we've spoken about already to help them understand the data that you're trying to present them to tell the story. So just moving on to something that's quite pertinent in this moment in time, we're looking at uh, this death goal um, from COVID-19 between February and April this year in the USA. We've got two charts depicting the same information here. So, 
what we can see on the left hand side is the linear scale and we can see as we all know that the rate's just gone up and up and up and you can see that quite sheer jump whereas a lot of media outlets are training the information about this using a logarithmic scale graph and at first sight it seems sensible and within this study there's been a, some defensiveness on how on why this decision has been used to show this chart but it doesn't necessarily convey the information about the nature of this so the results from the study here is that people looking at the logarithmic scale didn't quite understand the severity or the, the trajectory of what was happening so you look at the far right on the logarithmic step it looks like it's flat enough but lots of the time people are just looking at at that curvature we're not looking at the scale so that's not not giving the information we want we're not looking at in that top uh top uh, slice there's between 10,000 and 90, uh, 10,000 and 100,000. What I'm seeing and what a lot of people will see is the March 1st figure where there's that big increase and then it flattens out. So people aren't, from the study, just weren't comprehending what this graph was showing. So that's what we start to think about in terms of what are the different charts displaying. And there's several studies that are available showing how visual we're showing what visual cues work better and which visuals people understand most easily. And here we've just got an excerpt from William Cleveland and Robert McGill's paper on graphical perception. And this provides both guidance as to what visual communication has the most impact. If in doubt, scatter plots or bubble charts are always a good way to go. Bar charts are also a good choice. And let's face it, in EA, we do quite like ourselves a pie chart. But in all seriousness, different charts do serve a different purpose. Um, and again, I'll go back to the point I made uh, a little while ago in terms of you know who you, your stakeholders are. You've got an idea of what ticks for them in terms of do they respond well to a certain type of chart. I know some organisations will just flat out refuse to use the colour red because it sets too many alarm bells off. So do we use a different a color grading mechanism. So start to think about the kind of things that your end users are going to respond best to. You know them more than anyone in your organization. And finally, we're going to wrap up by looking at some example dashboards. We've spoken about them a lot. We've got different stakeholder dashboards to go through in terms of the role. What kind of groups are we looking for? And remember when we're going through these, these are these are things that you can do. To start with, something that you might have seen uh, us go through before if you've ever joined, joined any of our calls, but applications, are, there's always something that we're looking to manage. Um, whilst this um, visualisation cycle through to the beginning, what we're looking at is quite a small subset of data here. So we've only got about 20 applications on this example. Realistically, you're going to have many more. What we can do is start to use a visualization like this to plot thousands and thousands of applications to figure out what on earth is going on. And when this gets back to the start of it, what we can start to see is the different portlets arranged on our screen. So we're looking at the level five criticality. I only have four in this instance. I can see I've still got the three at retire and invest, but the one that's been retired eliminated. I can click on that, it filters down around it. I can see it's the IVR project. I can see the cost on there. I can start to see all the data that is here, what it's connected to and its properties. I can also see the application manager. What I'm doing now is opening up Microsoft Teams. I don't necessarily have to know this person. They're in my organization, they're managing an application. So I'm just gonna reach out to them and go, hey, what's going on here? Can you tell me what's happening? We've hit some key metrics. Give me some more insight. We're looking at filling the gaps while she was in the EA, so it's not always providing the full picture. And that's what we can do here. And encourage that collaboration to get in touch with the wider parts of the organization. So you can uh, be that go to and get in touch with whoever you need to to get that information. We can also look at an infrastructure dashboard perspective and we start to think about what is what can this be used for? 
So we can start to look at the different costs of our locations and look at the likes of the cost of our servers, where our infrastructure landscape actually is, all the different kinds of hardware, and we're starting again to filter through in terms of what we're trying to see. All of these portlets are linking together. From an information perspective, again, we're looking at the cost of databases, we're looking at the types of data fields we've got, we're looking at the data fields within the subject uh, within the subject areas and how they link to different servers. So all of this is coming from your repository. Anything that's been integrated so far from like Technopedia service now is helping drive these visualizations that you're popping on screen with thinking from well, information management. What what is this costing us? What is the status of and size of different parts of this information. Moving on from the technical side more to the capabilities and processes side of things, just sort of at the beginning, something that we're all probably quite familiar with, capability map. And we see that we can drill down into the lower step processes. So again, we're taking a different point of view here. We're not bothered about the applications in this instance. We're looking at capabilities. So we drill down into our capability. We're looking at that process that underpins it. We can see how it's all linked together. And what we're doing then is navigating through a bit more. We can start drilling down into our tree maps. And Nisha's gone through this before, how they can be sized and colored based on properties. We've got our graph view visualization, which we can see the indirect impacts. If I was to change a process on the right hand side, I can follow that pathway through all the way to the left to see what else I'm going to be impacting if I make any changes. So it's another perspective. And finally, we're looking at uh, the CFO dashboard. And as the name suggests, it's all about finance here. We're looking at something that is pure and simple monetary values. So we're looking at where is our money being allocated to and what departments, what projects, what are our projects costing overall? And we can start to see how all that breaks down and how all that's connected. So the idea with this is we're thinking about that end user. Uh, we're thinking about the story that they want to see, the story that you want to tell them in, term, in respect to the data that you guys work with day in, day out. So that is ultimately just a snippet of the examples of what you can start to produce. And ultimately, this is something you can do very easily within Abacus Enterprise. It's just a matter of figuring out, again, I'm repeating myself here, but it's figuring out who that end user is, what your stakeholder and your collaboration, collaborators need, and building this out for their use. So. Okay. That's great, thank you. The end of your slide there. Excellent. Yeah. Nick, Manisha, thank you both very much for that. That was great. Um, and well, I think we suspected this was going to be a popular topic. It, it certainly is in terms of the questions that have been coming in as well. So that's, uh, that's good. And we certainly have some time in which to, to answer those. Um, so let me make a start on that. Um, and I try, as I mentioned before, I try to go through these um, in, in the order that they came in. So it's a mix between those that have come into the, um, the Q&A chat here, also on our YouTube channel, but also um, in the chat window too. So firstly, um, and you guys can decide who answers this, how do the product owners ensure that the data is updated? Uh, adding a new server, for instance, adding a network component. Yeah, I might answer that one. So. Um, actually, I think this question came in before we'd got onto the, the slide about the integrations with um, CMDBs, but typically you'd pull in that data so, uh, automatically so that you don't actually have to key in the data each time a new server is added. Um, and the, the benefit of tying into a CMDB is that CMDBs will often uh, have some sort of discovery so that they, they automatically know when there's a new server um, and it will just with the sync into Abacus, it will just automatically be added in. Cool. And indeed, there was a, a follow-up question, which I think might have, um, from somebody else, but I think they might have been referring to this, asking how to ensure that this is done. I think from the way you've described it, essentially, um, an integration would ensure that this is done. Um, but I, is there anything else that um, uh, would, would give people peace of mind to know that this is going to happen automatically? 
Um, I think I think with the integrations, uh, you can you can definitely make sure that it's automated and it runs in the background. Um, and you can also check that, for example, where you have connections to things, so you can have maybe an application. Um, you can have a, a constraint on the application to say that it must be connected to a server. Uh, so if it isn't connected to a server, it can generate you a warning. Right. Cool. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so, um, while well, staying with CMDBs at least, uh, we had a, a question specifically about um, ServiceNow and uh, the sync uh, module that, uh, that we have. Uh, and the question being, is it a two-way sync or, or, or one-way? It's actually a, a one-way sync. So we, uh -huh. we sync from ServiceNow into Abacus. Uh, the reason for that is usually ServiceNow is the master source of that data. Um, but if you do want to write if there's extra things in Abacus that you want to write back to ServiceNow, you can also you can always set up a, um, an integration using the REST API. Um, so it's quite straightforward to do, and then you can write to ServiceNow also. Good. Okay. Thank you, Manisha. Um, here's a quick, simple one. Can you export diagrams? Yeah, I'll take that one, Peter. Um, so it's not quite as simple as just a yes or no, because the simple answer is yes, you can export the diagrams. Um, as images. But one thing that we are trying to do is use the diagrams from within uh, Abacus when you create them or import them from Visio to basically get them to be updated automatically from using the data that you're importing and integrating. And you can actually use these um, and show them through the likes of Abacus Enterprise. So they'll show their live based on the data. So they get updated automatically. But you can explore the diagrams. Good, excellent. Okay, well, thank you for that answer. Um, a question here, uh, how does it, um, and I think we're just talking generally about uh, integrations, how does it ensure that relationships, as in from applications to say process mapping, um, I, I think are insured? I think that's the question. Sure, I can answer this one. So um, actually it might be a similar answer to, to what I was saying about the um, applications to servers. But it's, it's, it comes into defining your meta model. Um, so you'll set up your meta model to say that you want applications and servers and you want a relationship between these. And you can decide on you know, the levels of enforcement um, to say that if you, if you must have a, um, a relationship between them or not. Okay, cool. Thank you for that, Manisha. Um, Trying to keep these in a, in a sort of a, a running theme if we can. Um, so another quick one here that's just come in, um, just in terms of integrations with another particular product, and that's Irwin. Um, so is there a way in which data can be synced automatically between Irwin and Abacus? Yes, we do have some out-of-the-box scripts to actually synchronize with Irwin. So um, either when you install Abacus or if you're using the cloud version, you'll see that in the scripts folder. Nice quick answer there, Manisha. Thank you. Um, you're making me get the next questions ready very quickly here. Um, so do we offer masterclasses on dashboard design um, and on algorithm authoring beyond what's available on the support site? Yeah, question. I can tell. That is a good question. So uh, we do actually uh, run training for both aspects mentioned there. So the algorithm training is typically uh, covered in our Rocket Start program and the Customer Success program, I believe, but we'll also uh, be happy to arrange to use any support hours to actually spend time training uh, a number of users on how to use the algorithms and, and also dashboards. That also is covered um, from start to finish in enterprise use on how we can start to think about how we design our dashboards and start contemplating who they're for. So, a short answer to that one is yes, we, we do run classes on that. Yeah, and I might just add that um, I think in the last digital summit that we held, um, one of our consultants held a session on this exact topic and, and dashboard design. Um, mm. So it may be possible just to, to watch the recording that we have of that, um, of that particular one. Yeah, absolutely. I think each time I see the dashboards that um, individual clients have created, I, I'm generally sort of struck by something interesting that they've done that I haven't seen elsewhere. And uh, so, you know, these sessions alone are a good opportunity to get new ideas for what to do. 
Uh, now, staying with um, visualizations and the use of dashboards, perhaps we've got a question here which says, um, how much do your stakeholders, um, stakeholders of CIO and business managers and application owners like to use Abacus? <laughs> Okay, so maybe that's a question that might be different from individual clients. I guess for you guys, you can make reference perhaps to perhaps specific projects that you've been involved. There's a follow on to this saying how much time was required to help them learn to use it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just start off with on in terms of the different clients that I've uh, been working with, basically lots of different domains from the business and CIO tend to find enterprise relatively straightforward to go into in terms of seeing that content that's laid out. In terms of picking it up, um, one thing that you might be familiar with, we've got Abacus Studio and Abacus Enterprise. Abacus Enterprise, it really doesn't take much training on in terms of how to use it. It's just a matter of laying out that, uh, laying out the structure of a, a dashboard and knowing what information is there. So in terms of training people on Enterprise, it's relatively straightforward and relatively easy to pick up. Yeah, and I might just add, so um, actually Nick mentioned in his slides um, how, you can, how you can get people to engage with your dashboards without them even knowing that they're doing that. So they might just access it through Microsoft Teams. So your stakeholders, your business an uh, managers, they could just go to Microsoft Teams and click on you know, one of your channels and view the actual dashboard um, and they can interact with it as well. So they don't necessarily need to know or need to be trained in how to use it. They're able to, to gain value from it quite easily. Cool. Okay. Um, well, so this next question, I guess, is coming from someone who doesn't have enterprise. Um, the question is, what data visualizations and analytics capabilities does Abacus standalone version have? So, uh, so we've been obviously uh, focusing a lot on the use of enterprise for uh, creating dashboards. Um, but, you know, I'll let the guys here answer. There are some capabilities within Studio, uh, which is, um, you know, the core part of the standalone Abacus. Yeah, definitely. So um, you can do your diagrams, you can do catalogs, you can do charts all within Abacus Studio. Um, and the analytics capabilities that we talked about, actually all of those come uh, within Abacus Studio. So the algorithm composer, um, even, the, even the scripts and the... Um, integrations they all happen within abacus studio okay and i think i can perhaps link this to another question that came in uh which is uh, can we link contents to um our sharepoint um again perhaps this this being um another way that information can be disseminated across an organization yeah absolutely so something we can do uh, both from within abacus studio and abacus enterprise is if you We'd encourage if you've got any documentation that you want to basically provide access to, we've spoken about that in terms of giving your stakeholders easy to access information, you can quite simply create a link from a diagram or within a catalogue to uh, your SharePoint site where that uh, information actually is. So you can start branching out from the tool, You're not trying to replace all of your SharePoint sites, we want you to be able to access them from using the tool as well. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Thank you for your attendance today. It's been a pleasure um, having you with us and uh, we look forward to spending more time with you again tomorrow. Many thanks.